I don't know where the animal came from. I don't know where it is today. Don't know whether it's alive or dead. But what I do know is that in the early 90s, there certainly appeared to be a black leopard trotting around the Otways. Simple as that. All of the reports of the cat that was seen in that patch, and it was about a 50k radius, over time were always black. And the description was pretty much the same. Big, long tail, big, powerful animal. Not your normal black feral cat. Something happened down the Otways. A farmer, he rang up one day and said, look, I found um, a faeces in my paddock. It's long and it's oily and it's black and it's got this really unusual acrid smell. I knew of um, a physiologist. They dissolve the faeces and pull out things like hairs and bone fragments and then go through the painstaking uh, method of identifying what that was. I should have boxed it up, locked the box and handed it over and had her sign a statement that on this day at this time that she received this half hour sample from David Katz. Should have. Hindsight's a wonderful thing. I also uh, went out of my way to contact the Melbourne Zoo and I said, look, I need a hair sample and I need a faeces sample from your black leopard. So I got that. What she found from the Wensleydale sample was two black grooming hairs from what appeared to be a cat. There was a possibility of getting some DNA work done on these hairs. The DNA extracted from these two hairs, the same Wensleydale hairs, were that of a black leopard. Okay, so hold that thought. Here, all of a sudden, there's like, hang on, we've got something here. I thought we had. I thought we had. From what I can recall, the report in the Weekly Times just basically said that there was some possibility that the results were cross-contaminated. I got pretty, uh, pretty offended by that, going, oh, OK, so, you know, you don't really want to know about this. When you put all of the sightings together, credible sightings, credible people, credible DNA, what would a reasonable person say? You're all, you've made the whole thing up? I don't think so. Those hairs were not Melbourne Zoo hairs. Those hairs were hairs from a faeces from Wensleydale. End of story. What you're talking about is a black leopard. One of the great mysteries of the Australian bush is the reported sightings of big cats. On average, a big cat sighting has been reported every day in Australia over the past two every years. Every day? Every day. Wow. For years, there's been reported sightings of big black cats in the Australian bush. Likened to a panther or puma, no one has ever caught one. What I saw that day ah, stirs me up a bit. Um, I glanced to the right, five, five metres away, was uh, an animal looking at my family. It had the most gorgeous black, glossy coat. And it was jet black and had yellow eyes. It was obviously not a feral cat. It was much, much, much bigger than a feral cat. At the start, I was like, oh, maybe my eyes deceived me. Maybe it was a dog. And then it turned around, and I could see the, the long black tail. This thing took off and must have gone underneath the wire and the fence, and this long tail. And it was just like watching a movie in slow motion. To me, that picture's burnt in my mind so good that uh, it'll stay for me forever. Look at it. That is huge. That ain't no feral cat. That thing over there, massive seen on and off for more than a century, killing farm animals to survive. Then there are the mutilations, a classic big cat kill style. I saw it lift its head, but then realised that I was there. Clear as anything, it dropped its head a little bit and stared straight at me. My thoughts at the time were, this thing could kill me, it was that big. It was as black as black as I've ever seen. It was a shiny velvet black. The eyes were as yellow as you can get, and it was staring straight at me. To be so close to it, to see, look into its eyes, uh, to see how big it was, to see how black it was, uh, it shook me up. 
I was scared. I guess it's probably like ghosts, you know, nobody believes in ghosts until they actually see one, but this was a panther, with no doubt about it. We get probably two sightings a week, and we have driven thousands of kilometres and walked probably hundreds of kilometres, tracking where there's been recent sightings, and there's nobody else that they can talk to about it. We're trying to find an animal that, according to science, isn't there. We're out to prove whether they are, and if they are, what then? There's no way that you can have sightings in areas right across Australia, continuously, over the course of 100 years, without there being some sort of established population uh, out there. There is such consistent reportage. To let it go would be unfair to those people who've been very upset by what they've seen. In fact, some of them have been challenged by these animals. It's a very legitimate fear. Customs today still talk about pumas as a enormous risk to the Australian environment. They can live in almost any climate. They're incredibly stealthy. People hunt them for years in America and never see one. You know, what about if what happened to the rabbits happens with something that's a lot more dangerous? I saw a, a black creature just here. Then it was here, closer, and it was a black cat face. So I charged at it, yelled, and threw my stones, and then took off. So what did you think? Oh, I was frightened. Yeah, I was, I was seriously frightened. When I thought it had gone away, I thought, well, that was interesting. But then when I spotted it up on this level with me, and then starting to advance on me, I thought, this is serious. It was so black and had those that feline walk to it. Okay, yeah. yeah, no, I've got uh, no doubt that they are here. I actually have seen one of these animals myself. That still means nothing. In uh, July 1973, I had the good fortune to encounter what appeared to me to be um, a black panther in the Warburton area. An animal appeared from the scrub intensely black with a very long upturned tail, about the size of a very large dog in the body. And the musculature had to be seen to be believed. You could see the muscles moving under the skin and also the shoulder blades going up and down. And I don't think I've ever had such a malevolent glare from a wild animal in my life. It was highly intelligent and it didn't like the look of me. Its eyes were even in broad daylight, you could see that they were bright yellow. Something's come through here. If you look straight through there, yeah. but I mean, there's nothing else there, but it's not a regular wallaby track, right? No. It walked down here past the trees and uh, and stalked him back. You know, there was, there was a person in his patch, in the cat's patch. My first sighting was in about 1972, after I'd um, left the army, and my father and I were spotlighting for uh, rabbits up near Whitfield up in the northeast of Victoria. He quietly said, I shine out the right hand side. I swung the spotlight around and to both our amazement, about 50 metres away in the paddock was extremely large black cat that was eating on a sheep that had recently been killed. I hadn't heard of panthers in the Australian bush and so my father and I were just both amazed at what we saw and didn't know what it was. screaming. I think something, I would believe it's a human or a child screaming. And then I said, oh, it'd be pretty cool if it was one of, one of those big cats that your dad and uncle has been talking about. Yeah, it, it sounds quite definitive, um, exactly exactly like a, a cougar. It's, there's no other yeah. explanation for it. It's like 100%. I'm not even, like, there's not one part of me that doubts whether that is or isn't a big cat. And I was just standing to see where those rocks are, and it was it was long, huge tail. Mm -hmm. I was like, what, what the hell am I seeing? And so the colour of the animal was black. black? Black, yep. Do you see any sort of patterning or anything like that? Any discoloration? Any, any no, just black. Through? Just straight black? And I just instantly went, that's a cat. 
We're going through the bush. The, the eyewitness was kind of pointing us in the direction where she believed she saw the animal. And right in the middle of the track was this giant furball, basically. Oh, wow. So you can see it's Do full of these... Like a bag or something? Little black furs. Oh, wow. And at first, I thought it was, might have been a hairball that an animal had coughed up. It was full of dense black fur. Um, but upon further investigation, it looks more like it may have been a, a scat, so it's coming out the back end. And essentially, that is full of black fur, but the thing that interested me the most about it was this mucus uh, membrane that was left behind, and that is basically what is testable uh, from a DNA perspective. Definitely interested in this. The most accurate and adequate DNA is this section here. Combine that with the solution, mix it up, and that will contain the, the DNA signature of the animal that actually left this scat behind. There could be a bit of a mix. There could be fur from the animal as it's cleaning and preening itself, plus fur of the animal that it's eaten. So there's a nice big long bit in the bottom of that as well. You sent away for a hair sample. He came out around the cows and found the um, a calf well eaten. Um, what, what time of day was that, Dave? Oh, late afternoon. Okay. Uh, it was still fresh. Um, really cool, cool, still wet. I've got photos on the other old phone. Um, the same thing. Opened up in the rib cage, the throat, and the hindquarters. Mm. Uh, which is and not dragged around like dogs. Not messy like a dog. Okay. Uh, Let's go. We'll go for it. Go and have a little look. Um, see, all of this is from crows and or eagles. Now, if there's going to be DNA, it's going to be right up inside here where nothing else has, um, has compromised it. Oh, there's a puncture mark. Right, two puncture marks either side of its neck. You can see how the tissue has been pushed away, so the puncture has been from the outside of the skin in. But see how the windpipe has been chewed off, all the inter internal organs are gone. Oh, so is that tooth mark, puncture mark. That's a, that's a beauty, that one. And this one here? Yeah. It's looks bigger. Yeah. Okay, so we've got a bit of blood as well. That'll do, but, uh, but it's a pretty good kill. Um, hopefully there'll be some DNA on there. Well, it's just so typical. And, and you wonder what on earth happens to the intestines. Where do they go? Look, dogs don't eat or take intestines. Um, there's no mess. Just a straight, clean kill as though you've done it yourself and gutted the animal. What on earth else in the Australian bush does this? Have you seen uh, a cat on the property before yourself? Yeah, I think it's like there's five times that I've actually five had a sighting of, yeah, well, of something. Of something? Yeah, big. Okay. Generally big, black, yep. Um, yep. and doesn't move like anything else. Where the, where the tree is over here, yep. uh, a few years ago we actually had, oh, there was like three kangaroos and probably four or five sheep yep. within a 50 metre arc of that tree. Yep. We've had some serious dog attacks, etc. Yep. But they're really messy. A big dog would just grab the bum and eat yep. meat off the bum while they're alive. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we had a problem here a few years ago. Most of the stock kills, either kangaroo or sheep or young calves that have been killed, are either by a farm dog, which is pretty obvious when you see a dog kill, compared to how precise the cats kill. They'll take the throat out in one, in one bite. They'll break the neck. 
even a, even a big dog can't pick up a sheep and cart it in behind some bushes before it starts to eat it. They just don't do that. The thing we're always looking for, and John is very good at finding them, is crushed vertebrae from the neck. Feeding is uh, nearly always the same. They go through the chest, or into the chest, eat the heart, lungs and liver, before starting on the red bait. Yeah, so this is that sheep there. It was eaten out of the throat. Yep. And the head and it peeled, skin peeled back again. Yep. But normally with a cat, you know, the yeah, it's the usually throat, always going to be around. It's clean. The throat. There's we'll no struggle. The yeah. There's no blood. Yep. Yep. Teeth marks the size of your little finger. Yeah. Which yep. you don't get with dogs and foxes. Yeah. This place is a bit of a uh, graveyard, like a killing field. I'm sure this is common for farms around this area, but the point is we're on a property that they've seen big cats numerous times, not just here, but neighbouring properties have reported seeing big cats. The, the amount of death just in this small radius is, is pretty huge. Another fox scat. Gotta love the calling card of the fox. He will leave, leaves his scats everywhere. Sheep skull with a few puncture marks in there. We all often think that big cats only attack the throat or the back of the neck, but sometimes they'll also grab the snout like that. You can see puncture marks there, which would make you think maybe someone's bitten this on the on the front of the face there and basically just suffocate them like that. But it's good, I'm, I'm happy that there's some form of death around this tree because that's what we are, that's what we're trying to target. Two samples in two separate states, that in itself is, is pretty massive, I think. If they both come back as positive for big cat, such as a leopard, that's, I think, going to make a lot of people wake up and smell the coffee. I believe we have uh, an extant population of exotic big cat out there, and most likely mountain lions and black leopards. If you separate those two species, those two species are found in an amazing array of different places. So the mountain lion itself is found from the very north of North America, all the way down through Arizona and California, through the desert area, into South America. And if you look at the leopard, the leopards, you know, triple that. It's found all over the, the parts of Asia. It's, it's 75 different countries in the same sort of habitat. You put Australia in there, anywhere around the fringes, and that's where we see a lot of the sightings. So there must be an established population of big cat there. I don't think there's anyone out there with actual big cat experience. Being able to work one-on-one -on -one with big cats, having a deeply ingrained obsession with big cats, that adds a fair bit of weight to my claim that there might be big cats out there. It comes down to an obsession that's turned into a challenge. It's like this giant puzzle that just happens to be about big cats, which is my passion. Whether they be cougars or leopards, I don't know. That's what I'm here to find out, but um, as far as the data is concerned and the information that we receive, uh, it looks as though there is quite a decent population and has been for a long time. Grainy photos and shaky footage, it's just... Enough's enough, you know? Time to knuckle down and actually have, get some answers. And of course, initially, the story seemed to be about US servicemen. That's the current origin myth. There are photos of US servicemen with mascots such as Black Panthers and Cougars. The exotic animal trade and circuses is probably the most plausible one, in my opinion. Probably one of the best examples of that, because there's a lovely photo of it, is the Sonata's Puma in 1922. There's some great photos of people there posing with this puma they shot. It was a burgeoning exotic animal trade, and people would go out and they'd hunt uh, panthers and tigers in Malaysia and Indonesia, and then they'd sell their cubs. And if you go through old classifieds, you'll find leopard cubs being sold at the Fitzroy docks. Uh, I found that the British Hotel Geelong was selling uh, tiger cubs at one point. So people would have all sorts of animals. Uh, regulations were quite loose into what you could exactly have. You know, people could have big cats if they wanted to, if they had the right 
status in society. Now, in the midst of this, you get kills that look like people who'd spent time in India and Africa thought look like big cat kills. You also had a very legitimate fear of exotic animals being introduced and running amok. And in a sense, the papers have lots of stories about, uh, you know, what about if what happened to the rabbits happens to something a lot more dangerous. Fortunately, the, as far as we know, nobody's been injured. An awful lot of people go missing. I think it's about average of seven a year in Victorian bushland and they're never found, ever. I find that intriguing, a little bit upsetting, but I'm too hard-nosed to let it bother me. I want to know why and I want to know what's going on. I don't feel comfortable in some places in the Otways without a firearm, because there is animals in there that shouldn't be there. I've got a heap of bait stuff here to use. I've got secret sources. These are my scent traps. You put scent in them, a little cotton swab there, and you attach it to a tree, and basically the scent flows out these vents, and hopefully something passing by will smell it. We time it right, we place them right, that they can actually smell the scent and wander over to it and be enticed in front of our cameras. This really stinks. Stick that on there and hope for the best. You want basically the breeze to come through and hit that scent and let it keep going. So we're actually in a pretty good area considering where we are. Uh, we've got some bobcat urine as well, which will spray around and just helps to add an interesting and uh, quite foreign scent to an area, which will hopefully entice an animal to come check it out. So fingers crossed, in a couple of months when we check these traps, we will have something worth writing home about. We've worked with camera traps for a long time now. We've taken some magnificent photographs of all sorts of wildlife. Photographed almost everything except a panther. From white fallow deer in the Otways, rare species of wallabies, lots and lots and lots of kangaroos, of course. We'll leave them out for about four weeks at a time. The camera trapping side of things, I think, is one of the, the most important aspects of what we do. Native species as well, they have no idea that you're, that you're there. Your presence is eliminated as soon as you leave that place. As soon as your scent is dissipated by the weather, those cameras are doing the work for you. So that is definitely the best way of doing it. At the end of the day, these animals are apex predators. They are good at what they do. They're one of the most elusive predators on the planet. If it is proven that they are out there, you know, if there's an animal seen that can potentially end someone's life, I feel like there should be some sort of notification or awareness. I mean, you imagine the kudos that would go with you being on the front line and go, we've got it. Or somebody shoots one and goes, here you go, and slaps it on the steps of Parliament House and says, what are you gonna tell us about this? We, didn't, we haven't been hunting in Africa. There's this wealth of secondary evidence, things like sightings, blurry photos, footprints and so on. You've got to have that definitive evidence to make it legitimate. And Simon says, you know, you find the body or you find the DNA evidence on a carcass and so on, and yeah, fair enough. Yeah. There's been a few particularly good sightings that I've had. One was three years ago, I was out spotlighting. There was about three of us, I think, in the truck, and we'd just seen some foxes, and they just paled in insignificance compared to the brightness of these big cat eyes. And I got the gun out, and through the scope, I'd be guessing they were about that far apart, super bright. I've rationalised trying to think what it could be, and the only thing left when I figured it all out was it just had to be a big cat. So we've got a few tricks up our sleeve. We've got a, a bottle of uh, mountain lion urine, which I'm hoping to employ, and 
that will work in a way that an animal will be compelled to come in and check it out, basically. So if they smell another mountain lion's scent in the area, then chances are the animal will come in and hopefully stop smack bang in front of our camera trap. So we've got to get a good look at it. Cougars are one of the most vocal of the big cats. We all think a big cat making a sound, you automatically think lion. Um, but cougars actually have more vocalizations than any other big cat. When a cougar is trying to communicate, whether it's a male or a female, with another mate, it has a range of different calls that it uses, uh, and they call it caterwauling. So the idea with the sound blasting is we want to broadcast uh, a sound of either another mountain lion or an injured animal of some sort to try and encourage that animal back in. So Steve's nephew, when we got there, we didn't know about this beforehand, but when we got to this property, he mentioned something about a cougar gun. He's got quite a high-powered rifle and the bullets to match so that if and when the opportunity arises, he will be able to adequately take down a big cat. So we've got Steve, who spent a fair bit of time in America, in Montana, so he knows all about cougars. Uh, it's definitely interesting to see the dynamic of people in the southwest of WA who have lived with the knowledge of big cats and especially cougars in that property so long. And these particular guys are pretty keen to get one, so I certainly don't go out to try and kill one. But I'm going to go out and see if we can see one at least. Yeah, so I would much rather shoot one of these big cats on an SLR camera or a camera trap than actually put one in a body bag. You know, we, we talk about the body on a slab, as John and Simon say, and like, um, yes, we need that DNA, but there are other ways of, of, of obtaining that DNA. If I can get, you know, adequate photos and footage of these animals with a camera and not put myself in danger and put, you know, potentially other people in danger by injuring a, a big cat if I don't kill it with a gun, uh, then that's obviously a win-win. an owl. Wow, that's cool. And just back. There. It was out there. There it is. Yep, I can see it. It's yep. a fox. Oh. I'll be a lot closer going by the cattle yards. Yep. Oh, it's such a perfect night for this. It's, um... Yeah, nice and still. Nice and still and... <laughs> Nothing down there. Uh, what was it? Uh, I thought I saw something to your right a little bit. No. It's a stump. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought I saw a little bit yowie. of red eye shine. A yowie! <laughs> 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 oh, gosh. Not my forte. <laughs> oh, look, look, look. Oi, oi, there's an eye. Straight hey. ahead. What's that? There's an eye straight ahead. That's a big animal. That didn't jump or hop. That maybe go lights. It's not off. a kangaroo. It's no. too bright. Maybe go engines off. And we'll just get the sound blaster out. That was a big animal. That was 
just in the tree line there. Big golden eye shine too, and it didn't hop away or move away. It just sort of moved off into the bush. It's, and it's exactly where Steve has seen something in the past. out that there it is. Well, I guess having a look in the gun will confirm. Yeah. Probably won't shoot, but I'll, I'll just have a look. Okay. It's probably down in the ravine. Yeah. You didn't know what that was. I didn't know what that was. His eyes are just so far apart that it just definitely wasn't a little pussycat or a fox or anything yeah. like that. In, in the exact, pretty much the exact same spot they used. So right there yep. is where I shot at the other one. So yeah, it, it's right in the area. Mm. I don't know what we saw. I tend to believe someone who has lived on the property all their life, who hunts on the property almost nightly, they know the difference between fox eye shine, kangaroo eye shine, emu eye shine, whatever. So when someone like that says, hey, what is that? I'm, this is my property, this is my domain. I know everything about this property, but I'm perplexed as to what that is over there. I take that very seriously. It was only a moment, momentary thing that we saw the eyes, and then they were gone. Usually farmers that have been around enough have heard the stories and have possibly seen it, so they wholeheartedly agree that it's out there. The people that haven't heard anything about it usually immediately say, you're joking, it's impossible, there's no big cats here, and they just deny it. Because we had just been talking about it in the car, I thought he was joking. You know, I had, I had crossed the light beam uh, of the ute to go and open the gate, and he's like, oh, there's, there's one. And I thought he was referring to me, jokingly, but he was being serious. Look. Oi, oi, there's an eye. It excited me in the moment, and looking back at it, yeah, I definitely take it seriously. The eye shine was very similar to what Steve saw that night that he actually looked at one through the scope of his gun. So, yeah, I'm excited to, to see what our you know, camera trapping results uh, yield. After checking the camera traps and coming up empty, the results came through of the SCAT's hair analysis. Okay. The sample contained mostly cow fur, and although they found a few grooming hairs, which may have been from a predator, they were unable to lock down the exact origin. So, official result, potential fox, or possibly from the cat family. Mm. If we have got a large predator exotic, doesn't matter where it's come from, established here. It will be in low density, it will be crepuscular, it knows how to keep out of the way. And it does that by choice. And for somebody to see it, it's completely fortuitous. Serendipity, sheer luck. Yeah, it's just, it's evaded me so far in many, many years of looking. What am I doing with my life? Why are we here? What's the meaning of life? 
Are there actually big cats in Australia or are they just big feral cats? I go out so often and see nothing except Australian wildlife, um, but occasionally I'll find tracks that are very fresh. Um, one stage recently I was out the back of the Bamber Forest and I'd walked down a track in the sand. When I turned around and came back, there were cat prints in my boot marks. He tracked me out, never saw him. So we finally got the DNA results back from the Stanhope scat and the Wensleydale calf kill. But what was it ID'd as? Fox. No. That was not a fox kill? No. No. That was not made by a fox. These were not made by a fox? No. John, do you have any thoughts about what might have been eaten from the carcass originally? Uh, I mean, clearly there's a lot of flesh gone from this calf. Probably three bucketfuls of meat. Yeah. There was an awful lot of meat gone. That, that's that's a good way to describe it too, because if you... you imagine how much market mm. meat is in a bucket. Exactly. Right? A fox can't do that. No. Fox's full stomach is about as big as my fist. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Even They're ten of them. You know? mm. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, we don't. The but question is what killed it in the first place. That's... Well, that's what this, this is about. Mm. Somewhere along the line, the swab is just... Re residual DNA from the foxes. Mm. So a fox has lick, licked the blood off or yeah. something? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It literally, they only have to breathe on it. Yeah, mm. yeah, technically. There's no way a fox would bring down a calf of that size, in my opinion. But... No, I, I don't believe it would either. Mm. <laughs> Which... I'd need to see it kill something exactly. mm. and then be straight out there. Yeah. Taking DNA samples is not simple. Not at all. So this is the scat that we found up in Newcastle. And this is the bit that you can see with the ruler here. <laughs> a lot of shit. <laughs> so it's a big turd. Just, yeah, that's why I was excited about it. But exactly the same result as your swap. Fox. Mm -hmm. Apparently. No. Oh, no way, no. I'm not saying anything. No, I know yeah. you don't have to. No. But did it, was it fox DNA? Mm-hmm. OK. Guess what eats foxes? I just wonder if, if the section of scat maybe had too much secondary DNA. I don't know. The only scenario you can think of is that a fox came along and that was stinking to high heaven, so he pissed on it. Possibly. Like yeah. they do, like animals do. Yep. Your dog oh. does it every time you take one out. Now, what was the fur? So cow, cow fur. But there must be some DNA inside a scat like that that isn't yeah. all fox. Well, like I said, the faecal matter has all but disappeared. It's just fur it's, and, and the mucous membrane. So it was already old. Like that oh, photo right, of, of my, with my hand next to it, that was day of. Oh, I don't know. It's hard. Uh, breaking that news to, to someone who, yeah, has hung so much hope on, on your shoulders. And yeah, I was really hoping to give them some good news from both their opinions, but especially Simon's. And Simon's a naturalist. You know, Simon, this is Simon's game. This is his field of study. And John has hunted foxes all of his life. And we're all of the same opinion, again, that that scat could not have come from a fox, but DNA proves otherwise. Shit happens. We know that. Yeah. We've like, seen the shit. Yet another inconclusive. Was, but DNA. the DNA yes. was buggered up. It, it yeah. happens. Mm. Anyway. Right up. Let's go. Got the DNA results back. Yeah. Yeah. Did it come up with anything? Fox. Fox. Yeah. We've never seen a fox with a bloody 10 millimetre bloody moment of truth. Probably a big cat that's, that's killed the thing, but um, can't get any any decent DNA out of it. It looks like it's just been...
contaminated by Fox. All right, thanks. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. It'd be nice, wouldn't it, if we had something hard to go by? And it's, it's not easy. We've all put in so much effort. New chaps might be Johnny, Johnny come lately, but by oh God, you've put in some work. Bloody hell, yeah. You'll get there. Yeah, we will. We will. Yeah, okay. Take care of yourself. I will. Jesus, you can't. Not really. Okay, see you guys. I think at this stage is inconclusive. Personally, I, I don't doubt the DNA that we collected or that John collected is in fact Fox. But I just do not believe that the calf was killed by a fox and that that scat was left behind by a fox. And that, like I've been out in the bush a lot of my life, you know, especially over the last few years with this entire hunt business. And it's um it's it's yes, it's it's probably a positive DNA result based on the collection. Uh, but it's not what has A, killed that animal and B, left that scat behind. It's times like this, like, because I've done it for so long, it's like, do you rethink your strategy, refine your methodology, or give up completely? It's either time to scale up or scale down. That's what I need to figure out. Until it's solved, um, I think I will be obsessed with the topic. We've gotten a lot of, a lot of reports um, and we've certainly spread the message and gotten a lot of mainstream uh, exposure, if you like, about the topic, which is what we need to one day solve it. Um, but personally, as a researcher, yeah, it's very, uh, it's hard to swallow that we haven't gotten anything solid. But that's the nature of the beast, I guess. I'd just like to solve this before I die. That's all.